Hello, good evening. Thank you all for staying and for coming to the film as well. Um, my name is Pauline Maloney. I work in my day job as a clinical psychologist with the health service in adult mental health and I'm on a board member of First Fortnight. Um, so thank you for coming and supporting our festival. Okay, is it on? Sorry, can you hear me now? I'm going to go a bit closer. Is that better? Oh yeah, that even sounds better to me. Um, so I'm going to be inviting you this evening um, to join and share your thoughts and reflections on the film and to ask questions to Mark. Um, so Mark, or, Max. Max, apologies. Um, Max, would you like to introduce yourself first? Or would you like to uh, yes, I would too. Um, Max Pugh, co-producer and co-director of um, the film along with Mark Francis, who can't be here tonight. Okay. So I just had a couple of questions for myself I wanted to ask you, which was, um, first of all, what inspired you to make this film about Thich Nhat Hanh and Plum Village? Well, it, it actually did start as, um, as an inspiration, because my, kind of full disclosure, my younger brother is one of the characters in the film. He's um, a monk called Fap Lin, his, his ordination name is Fap Lin, which is uh, Brother Spirit. And he ordained back in 2008 and was a family member as his brother was invited to the ordination, which Thich Nhat Hanh um, conducted. And I experienced a very dramatic moment of transformation and, and was witness to this incredible scene. And of course, the, as a filmmaker, I, I realized how kind of dramatic that was. And unfortunately, the moment had passed because I was sitting there and there was no camera, so it couldn't be a documentary. And I thought, well, maybe I should write this. Maybe it should become the, the story of a fiction film. And then the, the next thought that came very quickly was, the last thing I wanted to do was then expose my, my brother to the, the, you know, a young monk just starting this journey to his older brother's preoccupation with filmmaking. There couldn't be anything worse really than you know, renouncing everything and going on this path of, of purity and, and sort of simplicity and in the first years then having a kind of camera in your face. Um, so then I just, I just let go without actually knowing that that was Buddhist practice. I just let that go because it felt like the right thing to do. But I harbored, I guess, at one level, the, the idea to do it and to do, do it somehow. And then lo and behold, three years later, I was, I was there at the monastery at the Lunar New Year, Vietnamese um, New Year in early February 2011. And my brother came up to me, he'd then been ordained uh, three years with one of his elder monastic brothers, and they asked, would you like to make a film about us? And at that point, it's like the tables had turned. You know, if it's them asking me, that felt absolutely legitimate. Plus, he was three years in. And I said, well, have you, what, what are you thinking? And they actually had a treatment in mind. And they said, well, how about making it like a road movie, a road movie with monks and nuns, like a rock band movie, but with no sex and no drugs? That, that was a great treatment. I thought, okay, now I'm hooked. Do it on our tour of America. Every two years we go tour, do a teaching tour in America. And so that's how it all started. And, you know, a few months in, I then um, called up, you know, my oldest friend and collaborator, Mark, asked him to produce, and then we, very, we melded very quickly into co-directing and co-producing the film because we were both on different projects at the time and we needed to be able to, to cover different things and, and it was useful for us to work as a, as a pair. And very soon we realized that it couldn't just be a road movie. We needed to start it in their home in France. We needed to see the, the, the quietness, see the, the, the relationship with nature they have at the monastery, you know, experience the winter retreat, those things before they, they hit the road. So that's how uh, the, the, the film that you've just seen ended up um, as, a, as a film that starts quietly and gradually builds with noise and pace. Okay, thank you. Because um, I certainly 
felt that myself watching it is almost not quite a film of two halves where silence is very strong at the beginning of it and then I suppose was it something you were quite mindful of in making in terms of the use of words when a lot of films are very much about language and script that the power of maybe not saying anything or not having a voiceover but just a sound in the background yeah I mean we we really were confronted with the the need to somehow create a structure without having a traditional story. If you don't have a, a, a character arc, a, a, a development of story between, you know, a beginning, middle, and end in somebody's life where they 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 change and face challenges, surmount uh, issues. If you don't follow them from beginning to end, you then have to. To tell the story, you have to use different tools, and, and so what we found was, and there are reasons why we didn't do that, and then they're not because they're not for want of trying. I mean, we did actually try to follow stories from beginning to end, but the problem with monastic life is that they don't do email, they don't do mobile phones, and you can't get in touch with them very easily, and they slip away, and so we would find ourselves in France, and we'd come back a couple of months later and say, okay, we'd love to get in touch with Brother So-and-so, who just started telling us the story of why they become a monastic, and then we'd be told quite casually, oh, no, he's in Thailand now. Oh, well, when was that decision made? Oh, well, those decisions happen very quickly, and they suddenly go for three years to okay. the west coast of the US. They have many monasteries in the world. And uh, so we found it very hard to kind of keep tabs on everybody, and, and it was hard to to get any continuity. So we said, well, you know what? We're going to let go, again, this, this idea of letting go. And we're going to embrace the present moment. And whenever we turn up, we're just going to enjoy the present moment. And they, they sort of drummed it into us. It was very funny. We would go with this agenda in, in the beginning. We would go with this desire, you know, to, to follow a story, to, to, to get things. And they would say, you know, just come and have a cup of tea. And that cup of tea would end up lasting three days. There'd be many cups of teas. And, and come for a walk in the woods. And Mark and I would be looking at the clock and saying, you know, we're only here for five days. We need to film something on mm -hmm. day one. Actually, day one, you know, nothing would happen. But we would walk in the woods. And day two, nothing would happen. And it just... And then suddenly on day four, we'd get a scene. It was just this being there tuned in, we would then, were somehow able then to channel, receive the present moment and then pass it over to, to you through the medium of film. Um, I, I don't think we would have got there without the monastic practice that, was, that we were exposed to. Yeah. And so my brother jokes that actually it was his if he had an agenda, it was his agenda all of its time to get his older brother to understand his choice in life. And so, you know, he would, he would smile at you now and say his plan worked out. And you've shared it with the world. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions yet? I can see it. No? Oops, yes? Um, well, Thank you. Um, wonderful film. Um, and I had a question about um, the close up. You used it an awful lot. And I was wondering, you know, who was looking? And so you, you chose to show great detail of faces and scenes. And I was just wondering, uh, and, and I found that uh, challenging. To watch, yeah? and at the same time, um, it wasn't quite bringing me into the resonance with the people because it was so detailed. You know what I mean? In other words, I was looking at the detail, but I had to really work with it. But I was going, I'd love to ask you what was in your mind in terms of the, the extent to which you used close up of great detail of faces and things. Yeah? Well, the, the front row is the hardest place to appreciate the close up. No, but I think still. <laughs> so, um, if I'm sitting back there, I think it's the same question. Yeah, no, it, it could it's not, be. Um, let's not just get it off on the wrong tack. Just tell me, what, what was on your mind? Um, it's, it's about intimacy. Um, 
we really, we, we felt that, I mean, at one edit of the film, as we were approaching the end of the editing, included all of the off-camera interview material that we accumulated that were explaining, narrating the reasons why the brothers and the sisters made this radical choice to give up their possessions and ordain and choose this life. And we had this kind of running under. And there was a point close to the end when both Mark and I decided that that was, it felt too conventional, that we were giving, we were giving, we were explaining too much. And that we needed to, as, well, as, 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 as filmmakers, you're in the front row of your own audience. And both Mark and I like to be challenged by films. We like to meet filmmakers halfway when we're in the audience. We don't like just to sit back and be told everything. And so that's the kind of film we wanted to make, the style we wanted to, to work with and the tradition we, we wanted to work in. And so when we stripped that away, those voices, we then needed or felt we needed to make up for that lack of detail with a visual intimacy. And so that's the reason why that decision was made. However, we did feel that we, we didn't want to make it too intense. So it's immersive, and that was another one of our, our uh, kind of creative decisions was to try and immerse. But we also sit back and give very big landscapes and give a lot of context as well. So we felt that we were, at least our attempt was to play on those two registers, um, not to be completely kinetic and immersive and close up all the time. Um, though what's interesting is that I, I have, and this is something I'll never do again, but I have actually looked at the kind of comments on Amazon.com and things, and some people are like, it, it's all close up and out of focus and we couldn't see anything. And it, it's, it's a form of, it's a stylistical decision that, you know, Paul Greengrass didn't entirely get away with in the born identity and the born supremacy in those films. It's, in, and in documentary, sometimes you have no choice. I mean, sometimes you find yourself in a situation where you just have the wrong lens and not enough light and the scene's happening in front of you and, and it's just you. And uh, sometimes you can't quite focus as you'd like to. Um, but having said that, there, there, there were some, you know, creative decisions uh, made that, that resulted in, in that being the, the style chosen. And in fact, just to, just to finish that thought, the, the, the voices, all the voices that we had were replaced, we chose to replace with the readings from Fragrant Palm Leaves, because we felt that in the end, Benedict Cumberbatch's narration stood for the same, played were answering the same questions that everybody else was, was asking themselves. The, the, the kind of the existential, philosophical journey to enlightenment questions that all the monks and nuns were, were asking had already been written, had already been voiced by Thich Nhat Hanh when he was 36 years old, when he wrote, uh, sorry, wrote Fragrant Palm Leaves. And so by stripping away all those disparate voices, we then were able to replace them with a unified philosophical um, voice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Around? Yeah. I can't see very well. Oh, sorry, the other lady. I know, sorry, you, you kind of just touched on it there, but um, how did you come to choose the passages um, from Frigid Families to, to have as an overview for their film? It was actually quite an easy process. Um, it was lucky because my brother had given me fragrant palm leaves very early on, within the first year of his becoming a monk. Of all, I think, 57 books that Thich Nhat Hanh has written and published, he knew that it was the one that I would be able to relate to. Because it's the one which is least about kind of self-help. It's actually a, a visceral, personal story in, in diary form. That said, the book itself does go between those personal visceral diary entries and more 
and this is what I discovered and this is what you should do in order to feel better about yourself or, or to be more mindful. It was very easy to identify those passages that were very personal though. And actually we, we went through the book and, and, and we lifted those and extracted them. And in the discussions we then had with the monastics who'd been involved in translation, translating those texts and analyzing those texts very deeply, they agreed with us absolutely that they were the, the passages that were the most resonant. Um, because whilst being deeply personal, we also felt they were very universal. And, and that's what led us to make those choices. I mean, something that very much struck me, they were written 60 years ago, but still how much they apply to current life, you know, and so the first one I wrote down myself was beneath all these emotions, what else is there? And it's such a huge question that we can ask ourselves and how do we cope with life? And um, he speaks a lot about us running and racing and trying to get the next thing that will fix us or that will searching for a meaning or an answer. And actually, a little bit what you are saying earlier, it's about allowing things to happen and letting go, which is the hardest thing to do, but can be very powerful if we're able to do it. And, and much more powerful when posed as questions mm -hmm. rather than written as statements. Um, we, were very, we were very passionate about not feeling like we're lecturing the audience, mm -hmm. allowing, allowing, the, allowing us as filmmakers to one question leads to another, and not, not telling you what to think or how to think. Did any of those resonate with other people in the audience much? or Anyone have any reflections on it? Yeah, there's a couple of questions at the back here. There's a lady in it. Um, I, I thought it was a very unique experience in watching um, cinema. Um, I felt that um, the subject matter is so deep to me and personal to each person, um, but without a, the script being so formal, um, did you feel that it, it, this, it seemed to me like there was a huge innocence in what was achieved in this, in, in this um, production? Um, that, as you say, some existential questions arose almost intuitively in the, in the momentary process of whatever you managed to be in the presence with, with people, with events. Um, and there are some very uh, stark moments that have huge impact, like with the, uh, the girl who asked the question that, as children, I guess we've all asked somehow and um, ask when we're older. Um, as you've witnessed yourself as a um, you know, director and producer of this film, in what way going forward do you think the experience of um, making film like this, um, will, it, um, will, it, will it direct you in, um, in a uniquely different way had you not made this film in such a way that you did? Because it's stripped from, um, it seems like it's stripped from, um, how should I say, um, it, it was very brave. I thought it was enormously brave to use material that came mostly written by people themselves <coughs> rather than something that was mm. produced, you know, to go on to make a film. But it's the, it's the magic of documentary on one level, which, because mm. I also make fiction films, is something never to forget that the power of that and the, the the power of the the kind of unexpected and then also the the kind of um, the, the the magic of the present moment if you're open to it and if you're if you're ready to receive it and I'm not saying that was easy at the beginning it was we'd come in we'd be nervous we'd want to get something in the can and, and it, it, it took a while for us to to let go, but in that letting go, then that opened us up to to receiving the, the kind of the, the more magical, maybe unpredictable moments. Um, well, can that happen again? I hope so. Um, 
I would say this has been a training, and, and yes, I would certainly say that the, the, the lessons learned in, in doing this, of, of sometimes just sick, sitting and waiting and not getting nervous and, and giving more time, help enormously with discretion as a filmmaker, with kind of disappearing into the woodwork and, and being really being a fly on the wall. That helps. Um, and I think that, I, I'd certainly like to think that I could take that on into, into future projects, absolutely. Um, though Mark and I, many times along the process, had to just sit down and pinch ourselves and say, you do realise it'll probably never be this good again because we, we're in this environment of kind of love, total love and total acceptance, and nobody is hassling us, nobody is telling us that we should be doing this by this time. We're really able to just kind of let go and just respond artistically to the, to the moment with people who have utterly embraced us and trust us to represent them accurately or, or and and that's a, it's a great gift and it's a great privilege and it was such an extraordinary stress-free process and documentary making rarely is it's often about confrontation about negotiation um, and this and this wasn't and I think that that we we responded in a way to that act of the, them embracing us, we responded with a love letter, really, I, and I'm not ashamed to say that. It's not a, it's not a critical, competitive documentary. It's one which really shows the extent to which Mark and I were started a little bit sceptical and ultimately were convinced by what Thich Nhat Hanh and his community represent to the world. And um, I'm certainly not ashamed to say that. There was just one more question in the back, and then I'll come to you. Um, I want to thank you very much for a beautiful film. I have had the privilege <laughs> of being in Plum Village on a few occasions, and I think, you know, it was such, it's such an impossible um, feeling to evoke, but you have evoked that feeling. And also, when you mentioned, you know, your enthusiasm in the beginning, <laughs> your decision to respect your brother's, way of life and allow him to settle. And then things happen, and as, as Dignet Han has often said, things happen when the conditions are favourable. And there's a, you described in your answers the, the release of just trusting, because being there, is, that's what that evokes. So thank you very much. And I just wanted to ask another question. Um, my experience has been that in many of the monastics, they join at different ages with different life experiences. And some of them have had careers as singers, musicians, artists, <coughs> with, you know, an, an endless amount of skills. And I just wondered if, in the, your time there, were there suggestions made or were you put in contact with those people who may have been filmmakers? I'm just curious about that. Um, only once did I meet a monk who had been a filmmaker and he was actually more of a sort of chief camera operator in Hollywood. He used to work for Disney, um, so very kind of big budget, but not not on the kind of creative front line, more on the kind of in the camera department. Um, I don't know of any any other filmmakers, but uh, my brother was a, was a composer, was a musician before he ordained. Um, his, uh, his girlfriend was a producer on BBC Newsnight and she became a nun. Um, I should mention my brother is the one who compares his teacher to Yoda from Star Wars in the prison scene and he's the one who plays the cello in that Mozart string quartet scene. Um, uh, another one I know of, an architect before, and, and there was a, you know, like a special forces marine, US marine. <laughs> Which is, I mean, we, uh, the uh, French, French um, anti-terrorist police as well, and became a, he became a monk. It, it felt a little obvious. I mean, this is a, a side issue, but I mean, as, um, 
thought coming to me at the beginning of course we thought oh that's quite dramatic maybe this should be our approach but we felt let's we'll leave that to the television documentary makers who have shorter time to play with and need to be a little bit more dramatic up front and we, we chose not to tell those stories in this film but they're all there to tell i mean every monk and every nun has the most extraordinary story of how they came to to this this choice and the lady here is okay. Well, I was just going to say, um, I, I, I was at music school with your brother. Oh, and yeah. So we played music together. But uh, I suppose the question was, what was, the, what was the funniest experience when you were there? <laughs> there were many. I mean, it's actually, a, it's such a, it is a community in which people do laugh a lot. It's very relaxed. It's very... Um, it's not at all austere. In fact, Mark and I had to work really hard to create those first 25 minutes of the film that appear to be about silence and austerity, because it's... Because I presume they weren't, like, as you say, austere. They were kind of up. Mm -hmm. They were... Yeah, I mean... They across as very happy and... They do, I mean, we... I'm just trying to remember an actual, a, a particularly funny moment. I mean, there, there was certainly, I mean, just, just filming the last shot of the film, which is a sunrise in, in just in the, in the mountains behind San Diego, and I, I, I can't remember whether this was sequentially the last thing we shot, but it was towards the end of the film, and, and we knew that we really needed it. And just when we got the camera set up, and, and we'd been up on the mountain all night long, and with the, with the the monks who decided to go and sleep up there in their sleeping bags and listen to the coyotes and so on. And it had been a very, very beautiful, intimate experience. And it was Mark who took the camera and, and put it on a rock and just set it to, to film that sunrise. And just as he started it, one of the other, the, the brothers turned around and, and said, just switch it off, switch it off, just enjoy the present moment. And that was actually... <laughs> You know, we have to go back to London tomorrow. We really want this shot because we think it could be a really good ending. And so, you know, as long as this doesn't leave this room, we just pretended not to switch it. <laughs> switch the and we kept it running, of course, and um, and uh, and they didn't realise it. Of course, now they oh, you know, it's such a wonderful final shot of the film. It's it's so good. It's so good that you were able to get that. And actually, in, in the various Q&As that we've done with our monastic brothers and sisters present, um, there tends to be a slightly revisionist telling of the stories from their point of view that we gave them complete access, we, we embraced them completely, it was easy from start to finish. From our perspective, it wasn't that easy. In the beginning, you know, it wasn't that we had doors shut in our face, but we certainly had a lot of brothers and sisters slightly skeptical about, you know, why we were there hanging around, why, why it was taking us so long, why we couldn't just get this done in, in six weeks, why, why did we keep on needing to come back, why were we disturbing these meditations and, and so on, and that gradually melted away. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's funny to think of, of you know, the difference between kind of their, their point of view now looking at the finished film and then forgetting the times in which, you know, they, they found the actual process of, of making the film a little difficult and they felt that we were actually a little close. We were a little intimate at times. And some, for instance, that scene where the, the nuns recite the precepts and, and uh, you know, that had never, ever been put on camera before. I mean, nobody's ever filmed that before, and, and there was a lot of discussion about whether that was legitimate and so on. Um, and so, you know, it was, uh, it's interesting to think back to those moments sometimes. Thank you. Um, there was a lady at the back first, and then here and here. Hopefully I've got everyone. Thank you. 
No, it's... Um, yes. There we are. Perfect. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on a wonderful, mindful, inspiring film. And I think you did um, meet Ty's um, injunction to do that mindfully. So congratulations on that. I wondered um, at the beginning, were we going to hear a Dharma talk from Ty? And apart from um, a few statements that he made and the uh, quotations, from the fragrant plants. There was none. And I wondered whether you'd made a decision early on not to use it as a kind of vehicle for promoting Thai's teachings. And then as it went on, I realized this is promoting his teachings in a very non-descriptive, um, if you like, uh, verbal way. So was that a decision made early on that you weren't going to use? Uh, I thought at one stage he was going to give a Dharma talk. And then, you know, people who don't know much about Thai and, and Thich Nhat Hanh would get his message in a kind of a longer way. So the question is, did you decide earlier on not to do that? And to do what you did do? We, we did make that decision because we felt that, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was try and get this to as large an audience as possible and try and get beyond the, the people who are already aware of Thich Nhat Hanh or who had already been on retreats. Um, in a way, it felt like that was a little easy to, to get to that audience, and, and if we could push beyond it, we needed to try as hard as possible to do that. And so, one of the ways was being a little distant, as using some distance as filmmakers to show some things that, um, you know, I, I, I cite the Christian preacher in New York who, you know, effectively shouts abuse at them, or the, you know, uh, the monk who, um, Fab, who who yawns and who can't you know can't sit still and you know the nun who says it can just can sometimes get a bit boring and you know we, we needed to to um, include a little bit of grit in the oyster um, to, to 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 have any legitimacy as filmmakers at all with the, with the wider audience let alone the critics. Um, so that was one thing, and the Dharma talk or the non-use of any extended sequences of Dharma talk was very much part of that decision. I, th I genuinely think they would have that would have sh that would have um, shut down our ability to, to get to a wider audience. So that that, all that material is all available online now, and that's the beauty of it. Um, if anybody wants to listen to a whole Dharma talk or, or, or longer extended sequences, they can simply put it into Google. And that releases us as filmmakers to just tease with extracts. Um, that said, you, you are right in saying in the end, and I said it earlier, it, you know, it, it does take the form of a, of, a, of a kind of form of love letter in the end. And therefore, can be seen as a as a promotion of um, certainly, yeah. But I, I think it's a, it's a subtle one, and one which I believe personally, I'm I'm happy to say is done with enough objectivity, sufficient objectivity. Okay, right in the middle, and then over here. about how new technologies such as virtual reality can help people to have experience of meditation and uh, altered states of consciousness and change the mind. So I would really like to thank you. I, I really enjoyed the experience here today. I felt it was quite immersive. I kind of felt I'm there at some moments. For example, when it was like someone was saying breathe in, breathe in and breathe out. So, I think it's kind of um, changing. Usually people, when they go to the movie, they see, okay, this is the movie, this is me. 
and they're like separate entities and which is very similar to in life a lot of people feel like okay I'm a separate person from entire world however some of the central ideas of Buddhism and other religions is that we are all the same like the cloud is the rain the rain is uh, the tea and we're all interconnected so I think it was very great to have like to project this idea of all connectedness and the, the, for, for people to feel like they're actually part of what's on the screen and I hope other people felt similar and it's kind of reinventing the entire film industry hopefully so I have two questions the first is was this something that your intention was so that the experience of the audience is very different so that they're actually immersed in the movie and the second is where do you see the future of film industry going uh, with helping that maybe like 3D movies or uh, virtual reality experiences or like the movie, the cinema theaters transforming to like sitting in meditation as it has been? Well, the, the second one is uh, kind of way, way, way beyond my pay grade, but I would, uh, you know, Alejandro Inaritu, you know, the, the director of Birdman and The Revenant, who was a great support to us on this film and who came on a retreat to Plum Village a few years ago and said that it changed his life and therefore he, he really helped us, you know, with one version of the edit of this film and then it's very much supported us in our, in our release. He made a, an immersive uh, virtual reality film um, about uh, immigrants crossing the border from, from uh, Central America into North America across the desert and, and you can only experience that film using VR glasses and I've seen it and it's absolutely extraordinary. That said, it does not fit every story and every subject matter and I think that actually it's much more about the subject matter and the values of the film than it is about the technology. So. My gut feeling is that it's not about 4D, it's not about virtual reality. I'm very happy with two dimensions, because I think you can go anywhere with two dimensions. But the effort has to be made in the, the choice of subject matter. And that's where the revolution is. And certainly I'm, I personally feel very happy to be, happier to be dealing with this subject matter than than, you know, gratuitous violence or uh, for entertainment's sake, um, for instance. And then the question before, um, which I've forgotten, sorry. Uh, was your intention? Oh, the intention, yeah. For people to have a massive experience? Well, it, it, it was, and that was very much responding to Thich Nhat Hanh's challenge as well, okay, to turn cinemas into meditation halls, we need to use the tools, we need to use the, what we have at our disposal, pictures and sound, to try and immerse and to try and communicate the feeling we had of meditation practice. Um, so it was, that, that absolutely was our intention. Again, in the absence of traditional story, you then have to, have to do something else. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. There's a lady here waiting patiently very, for a long time in the fourth row. And that come to you. Yeah. Hi, thanks very much for the film. Um, you didn't actually interview them directly. Uh, again, you, you probably answered that question of why you didn't. And I just wondered if you actually maybe talked to him and filmed any footage um, with him that you haven't used in the film. And also, I was wondering, were you filming at the time when you became very seriously ill? And did that have a huge effect on the community? Because there was a time when people thought he was going to die. Uh, yes, we were there. We were absolutely there in the hospital. Uh, but we were never going to film that. Uh, that, that was so deeply, deeply moving to his students, his, the monks and nuns. Uh, there's no way we would have... Uh, put the camera up in those situations. Um, 
It was, it was hard for us too because we felt we'd become very close to him. And, and we, we had actually finished filming by the time he, he had a stroke and he came very ill. We'd done it. So the idea of then putting out the camera again and just getting more um, felt wrong. So there was no, no doubt about that decision. Um, and then interviewing Thich Nhat Hanh, well, you know, I've seen a lot of interviews with Thich Nhat Hanh, and he does not answer questions conventionally. He answers questions with a teaching, and we felt that that material existed out there, and a good example was a scene that didn't make the, the film, but is very good, where he invites us to tea, I think it's just me at that point, in, in his heart, and I turn up and he just tells a story. He tells the story Stone Boy, which is in his collection of short stories. He tells the story from beginning to end, and then at the end of it he said, and you should make the film of this. <laughs> Who knows, maybe at some point. But um, it, it's, not a, it's not a conventional relationship where my questions would be answered in a way that I would find satisfying. So our, our decision was to stay well away from that. And I think he appreciated that very much because he really doesn't like having cameras around. I mean, he realizes the, the power of them and how they can get to people, but it, it makes him uncomfortable and I can feel that. So we didn't want to subject him to, to that. And, and also his, his idea of interbeing, you know. I, I am in, in my students, and my students are in me, we inter are, and therefore, why are you filming me? And when you're filming them, you're filming me. And so, you know, when we sort of realized the implications of that, we felt very confident about this idea that actually we could film anybody in the monastic Sangha and actually be dealing with the subject matter head on. Yeah, I think that really came across. And I think the last question to the lady there in the black, about five rows from in the, in towards the middle. <coughs> Hi. Gosh, I better make it a good one. <laughs> um, well, first of all, you um, offered us the film before we saw it as um, a meditation. That was your aim. And I think the experience of the movie is that and the experience of the village is that. And I think you've captured that very well. Um, so one of the things that particularly struck me was just the, the joy of seeing children just doing very simple things, because we do not see that very often. I thought that was amazing. That was something that was captured really beautifully. We need to remind ourselves that children don't need all loads and loads of stuff. But my question is twofold. One is, what did Ty think of the film? Um, not that he ever answers a question directly, as you said. And you mentioned the word Sangha there just in your last answer, and I just wondered, was it a, an editorial choice not to go into the fact that there are Sangha communities all over the world? They were briefly mentioned, but just if you could comment on that in some way. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't want to give... Um you know, all of that information in the film because it, it would have become a different kind of documentary. Um, and we've been criticised for that, and I, I take that off. Um, but it, it wouldn't have been the immersive meditative journey that we hoped, it, that, we hoped that we offered um, had we put all that information in it. Um, that information, again, is all, all there online for people who are curious. Um, and so, you also asked about the, well, actually that was a really nice point about the children. Um, you know, I have young children, so does Mark, and when we started filming, they were kind of three, four, five years old, and, and we've seen them actually grow up over the years of taking them to Plum Village and hanging out there, and it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, yeah. uh, it's an extremely, relaxed, wholesome place where the adults, where the parents are so relaxed that the children get a lot out of seeing their parents so relaxed and also just kind of end up running away 
and forming friendships that last for years. And, and um, I, I hope, I mean, I live in France, not too far from Blum Village, so I hope to keep, a, keep that relationship up and for my kids to feel like they can go there in the, in the years to come, should they choose to. And how did he respond? Well, that's an interesting one because he <laughs> had his stroke and, and oh. could never speak again. And um, having said that, he surprised all of us in on the 18th of September or something like that. I uh, was asked to go to Bangkok by the uh, Thai distributor of the film to um, to do all the press interviews and to do the premiere screening there. And lo and behold, 30 seconds before the theatre, the packed big 600-seater cinema in, in Bangkok, uh, 30 seconds before the film started, they wheeled Take that hard into the back row. And I was right there, and I was going to leave, because obviously I've seen the film a few times. And uh, I then said, oh, I can't leave, I have to sit here. And I could see for the whole 94 minutes, he was actually just watching, transfixed. Mm -hmm. And I, I was surprised, because I'd heard that now he gets very fidgety and that he needs to change position and, uh, quite frequently. But then it was confirmed to me that nobody expected him in his team. This is a massive secret operation to bring him in the service elevator and, and through the shopping mall into the cinema. Uh, nobody expected him on his team to, to, to stay more than about five, maybe ten minutes, and he was there for the whole thing. And then I got the invitation later that night back at the hotel, please join him for breakfast the next morning. So uh, I went, turned out he was in the, the room next to me in the hotel, again, they, kept it completely locked down, I have no idea. And so I asked him, did you enjoy the film? And he, he nodded very vigorously. And I was told that he just doesn't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. or oh, I guess he liked it, is what I could say. <laughs> Just to say, that's possibly because mindfulness is about the present moment, but what you really captured was the experience and the richness of the present moment that we can have. So thank you so much for that. Thank Indeed. you. Thank you, Max, for coming over to talk and share your experiences of the film, and thank you all for coming and staying for the discussion. It was great to have you, and as is up here, if anyone's interested in a somewhat related theme, the departure is being shown on... Saturday, which is about a Japanese Buddhist priest, a little bit different in terms of he's made a career out of counselling people who are suicidal in Japan. And um, the week after, 32 Pills, um, My Sister's Suicide is on, and which tells a story about a lady who's trying to understand her sister and why she committed suicide. Um, and both of those shows will have a post-show discussion as well. So um, you're very welcome to those too, and anything else on the festival.